Welcome to CivilNet. I am sitting in a beautiful park in one of the suburbs of Yerevan. My guest is Carolyn Mugar, the founder, the visionary behind Armenia Tree Project, which just celebrated 20 years of operation all across Armenia. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Mugar, mm -hmm. uh, we have followed the work that you've done in Armenia. We've heard your name. We know that you were the the vision, the leadership behind Armenia Tree Project, which has celebrated its 20th anniversary in Armenia. 4.5 million trees planted. It's, it's an incredible endeavor. I want to understand. I mean, I'm sure you get this question all the time. Why did you feel it was important to plant trees in Armenia? But before we talk about why you thought it was important mm -hmm. to plant trees, I want to know who you are. I mean, where did you grow up? What were, what were your dreams and notions? and uh, how did all of that, how did that journey lead you to where we are today? I'd like to know the answer to that too. <laughs> we share that interest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to know it about you too. Um, it's, it, I don't know where to start, but um, I would say that I didn't grow up particularly Armenian. I grew up in Watertown, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is very Armenian. My father was Armenian, my mother wasn't. He was born in Kharpet and came oh, okay. to the United States in about 1907, I believe, and um, was a child of six. He came before the genocide. He did, but he came after the massacres of the 1890s, right. and his father had come previously to Worcester and worked in the steel mills and went back and married and had three children and came, and his mother actually was pregnant with the fourth child mm -hmm. on the boat, and um, they came to the United States, and long story short, he, he ended up, the family ended up um, able to buy for $900 a small grocery store in Watertown, and then it went from there. But it, I wasn't, we weren't um, submerged in the Armenian community because my mother was not Armenian and my father at that age, the people really believed it was very, some people, some Armenians felt it was very important to be a part of America. Yeah, that generation didn't speak Armenian at home, did they? A, a lot of them did, but there were the, those who didn't. So I can't really speak because I wasn't really part of the Armenian community then. Mm. But he, he worked, he employed a lot of Armenians, he worked with a lot of Armenians. But um, he was more concerned about, you know, planting his, making his stake in this new country and making it secure for people. You know, there's a wonderful William Soroyan story that talks about they, no one felt that they were actually in the, in the Fresno, in the United States, in the new land until someone died and they buried someone. And there's something about roots, land, under, connection. Yeah, connection, ground. So there was various ways that people felt they had to be secure and connected in the new country. So that was, that was, as I believe, that was his practice, his attitude. So, but when he got to be older, when he got to be about 70, 72, he was very active in starting the Armenian Assembly. So it interested me, and I would sort of hang out with him and tag along and just go to meetings and really... Um, and did you know about... I mean, I, I'm sure, even though you say you weren't part of the Armenian community growing up, you knew about Armenian history, you knew about... Sure, and I did, and I knew about... Um, I actually was very interested in the Holocaust, and um, I was... Uh, and I knew I was relating to the Holocaust because there was a lot of available information about it. Yeah. And I knew that the, what we came from, but I wasn't... Um, it wasn't slammed on me, you know, it wasn't... Um, I wasn't inculcated mm -hmm. in it. So gradually I just got started to get very interested and um, started poking around and, um, and became active, became much more active in there. Uh, and what were you doing in your sort of normal life, working? Oh my gosh, I was doing a lot of different things. I, um, I have to, you know, I tried to write once um, a resume and I gave up um, because it was impossible. I, could, I can't even remember um, the, the things various things. I, I was often um, quite active. I was very active in the uh, against the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and I worked with um, active duty GIs to um, to stop the war. Mm -hmm. And we had a very effective project right near an Air Force base in Idaho. And mm -hmm. you know, it's that kind of thing. Uh, I finally went to law school. Um, finally, why finally? Well, fi well, I mean, it was um, I don't know, 31 or something, oh, because okay. I, I didn't go right from college. Mm -hmm. And um, I really didn't like solving problems through um, that kind of structure. I would much rather that no one came out a loser, but people re recognized that they had to work together. Mm. So I didn't really like the system, although I respect much of what lawyers do and how we need to win cases, and I understand the importance. Um, so 
that. But you could fight your battles outside of the courtroom somewhere else. Yeah, and building different platforms. And well, and also building people up so that they had better communication skills, so that there was more negotiations mm. and more mediation. And right, right. Avoiding the conflict before it actually balloons into something that has to end up in court. So, you know. Right, and also so that when you, if you do win, that you've brought the people that you can bring everybody along with you, not have there be, um, uh, we've seen this historically, that when people have been large, large losers, so to speak, they come back afterwards. And so you've got to integrate the pe everybody, you mm -hmm. know. Into the process. I, I'd like to see that happening today. Um, I often say that uh, my generation, your generation, our generation in the diaspora, um, for those who were engaged or those who sort of were on the periphery of Armenian traditional communities, um, you know, growing up uh, during the Cold War, mm. uh, understanding the, the power of the Soviet Union, um, I think that a lot of us never believed that the Soviet Union would collapse in our lifetime, that there would be a slim hope of Armenia ever gaining mm. independence. And then came the late 1980s. Uh, with Glasnost and Perestroika, and we saw things shifting in the world. I mean, those were really exciting times. Unbelievable in a way. I mean, yeah. I know nobody thought right. that the Berlin Wall would come down. Nobody thought the change would take place sure. that way, which is a good lesson, I think, that we don't know Nothing necessarily is, how yeah. change takes place. Right. And we have to be alert prepared. and prepared, and we have to be strong at all times. You know, you have to be ready and mm -hmm. agile. You have right. to be agile. Uh, and then started the, you know, the Gharapag movement, the earthquake, the Gharapag movement, the Gharapag war, uh, Soviet Union collapsing. I mean, it, uh, when I look back on those days, it, it really, w they were historic moments that we were in and we didn't maybe realize those, uh, what was taking place we did. And, and I don't know if we were agile enough as a nation to adapt to all of the changes that, that were taking place. And then of course came, you know, the, the tragedy sometimes, I mean, the blessing of independence and then, you know, the, the years immediately following independence where the Armenian people were faced were with tremendous challenges. What were you doing at that time, in, you know, in the United States? Uh, were you following the events? Was it impacting your life in any way? It, it, it very much impacted our life and not to, for, not to forget the earthquake before that right. and the pogroms which forced and people. And yes, that's right. correct. And, that, and there was an influx of people, refugees mm -hmm. on top of earthquake. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing time here and I was back and forth a little bit at that time um, with the Armenian Assembly. And you were coming to Armenia yes. at the time? Yes, I was. Um, and it was very, um, it, it, you felt like you were in the middle of something that you knew you wanted to participate in. You had to add to the positive side of things. Mm -hmm. And when you say we weren't prepared, I don't know if anybody's ever prepared mm -hmm. for things like that. I mean, I, we, I think we were as prepared as anybody mm -hmm. could be. Um, uh, I think that the preparation, we need to now probably be more prepared. Yeah, <laughs> we need sure. to strengthen ourselves more. Yeah. Because um, now that we have some wins, so mm -hmm. to speak, you know, it's now the time to strengthen people and to really build um, more of a fabric of a society. Yeah, absolutely. So when you were coming, you were coming, uh, you know, uh, on fact-finding missions or for delivery no, of aid or... Actually, as I recall, and I, my memory is terrible, it always has been, though, that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news that it still is. But um, <laughs> um, we came, the Armenian Assembly actually started delivering kerosene to people. Mm -hmm. And also we built, an, um, uh, through Harad Havnanian's leadership, we built a factory that created bricks for people making houses and window frames and what have you that the factory still exists um, in Gumri. And um, so we came over with the specific, those specific um, activities. Mm -hmm. But what was valuable about coming was just simply coming right. and seeing what was happening and how it was happening. Mm -hmm. and um, Being part of that too, I mean. Yeah, the spirit though was still, I mean, although people were terribly, and then as you point out, when the blockade happened, that was really such a slam. But you know, it was amazing the sense of humor that people had throughout <laughs> it, and the jokes were just <laughs> really <laughs> legendary. Yeah. You, know, you should really collect the jokes sometimes yeah, from that perhaps, period of time. Yeah. But, um, you know, people were very actually united in a lot of ways at that time. Um, uh, I, have a, I have a cousin who came, well, his parents came in the 1940s during the great repatriation from the Middle East. Mm. And um, mm. when I first came to Armenia, I met with him. And he told me a story of how in those, uh, as, as Armenians 
uh, refer to the cold and dark years, right after independence, when during the blockade, the energy crisis, that how he and his father would walk a few kilometers from their house, where there was a small forest, mm -hmm. and they would cut down the trees mm -hmm. and then tie them mm -hmm. and then drag them home mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. um, they had no source of no. Uh, energy. Yes. And, I, I, and, and then, you know, we've all seen the pictures of how Yerevan, in the, in the middle of winter, it's dark and people were cutting down trees and dragging them through the streets of Yerevan. Um, were those the images or the, the things that you actually saw or witnessed that, that motivated you to start something, to, to make some kind of change? And it wasn't just about charity, it was about mm. education and... Well, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I know what you're asking, and um, those, those images are profound. I mean, one image that I'll just add to that that was horrifying, but it was true, is that dogs would pack because people couldn't afford to feed their dogs, mm. so dogs were on the street, and they would pack, mm. and the, they had to shoot the dogs at night mm. because they actually became aggressive, sure. and they were dangerous. I mean, it was that kind of image that you remember, and the extreme cold. It was a terrible winter. Um, and people literally burning books and bookcases yeah. and, and the hardwood I, we, floors, right? The hardwood floors, pulling yeah. them up, which is what you would do, True. right? And if you have I, to survive, you do it. And you cut down trees. Of course, you would do that. But it was very profound to see the trees cut and also to recognize that that was the reality that people were living in. So a lot of people. I mean, at that time, I, I can't honestly remember how it happened, but it looked to me like. Um, you needed to do something in response to that need. I mean, the fact that trees were cut was both symbolic and real. And to create a sense of um, commitment to the country, it was important to respond accordingly. And that was to, you know, I'm, we're going to believe that if you put roots here, this is a place that's worth putting roots in, that we're going to get beyond it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was symbolic, but it was also a real need. So. You know, so what did you do? You came together with some friends, with colleagues, with your family. How was it that you came up with the idea of the Armenia Tree Project? Um, at the time, I, my my husband, who was deceased, was an environmentalist, and he was mm. he was he's Irish, mm -hmm. but he came back and forth with me several times, and he had um, a lot of know-how in terms of um, environmental um, wisdom and knowledge, mm -hmm. and so. A friend of ours had just uh, taken a leave from a job, Regina Eddy, mm -hmm. and we said, well, let's just do something about this. So um, we started working with Regina, and we said, well, let's look at the J Jewish National Fund mm -hmm. and, and see how they do it, and we did that. And then we just said, well, let's just find some people. So we dealt with um, Nune Yakiazarian, who was at the mm -hmm. Armenia Tree, uh, at the Armenian Assembly, Something. knew a woman, Anahit Gazarian, who um, was a teacher. <laughs> Okay. And she said she'd be great. She knew nothing about the environment. She was a teacher. She's a person that can do things. So right. we just started. We hired her and Arthur Trumpian and we started to do the best we could. We said, well, let's just start planting trees. So and we found some trees to buy from a nursery. That's, a, that's another long story. All right. And um, we started planting in, a, uh, in an old age home. Mm -hmm. And now we're sitting in a park uh, in one of the suburbs of Yerevan, Tavtashen where Armenia Tree Project has planted most of the trees uh, and it's it has it's not only about planting trees for me it's about contributing to the quality of people's lives mm, mm. so that families can come here in the summer in the spring in the fall in the winter and have the experience of being surrounded by beautiful trees so more than the deforestation and the obvious reasons mm. why Armenia needs to have uh, a systemic sort of structured plan of reforestation, uh, of sort of uh, recouping the loss that we suffered mm -hmm. at the beginning of independence of all the trees that were killed, or because I think they're living, breathing beings, yes, and you know, yeah. you know um, and it gives the energy back. How do you feel when you come here and you see sort of the fruits of your labor? Well, it's it's I, I'm always in awe of mm. what 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 is because you know just to live long enough to see the trees grow is, yeah, is a wonderful, sure. wonderful thing. Yeah. And to see, we've tried to plant in places where it really mattered to people so that people could sit out like on today and right. be in the shade and where they can um, be with their children. Mm -hmm. it, it just matters a lot. It, it, it's creating the opportunity for community mm -hmm. and for people to say, this is my country, I want to keep staying here. We must do that in every way possible right. to make it more breathable, livable for people. So it's, it, it's hard to imagine it when you start it, but um, 
a lot of people got on board. I mean, I have to say that it was through the support of so many people recognizing the same thing. It wasn't just my idea. It was a lot of other people saying we've got to do something. So they deserve a lot of credit and so many supporters in the diaspora. Sure. I mean, everybody, I think that a lot of people in the diaspora and many, many people in Armenia also know uh, about the mission of ATP. And you just say ATP and they know oh, it has to do with trees and, and mm -hmm. replanting. Mm -hmm. And um, it all starts with an idea, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we were talking earlier how the problems are so big and you don't know where to begin mm -hmm. to tackle. Mm -hmm. That if one person has one idea to fix one aspect, then if all of us did our part, so that sort of that union of voices mm -hmm. and ideas, then, then you can make change. I, I always say everybody is capable of doing something, and no matter, no matter from where you are. Mm -hmm. And you just have to make that move to ask someone something. Or someone should come to you and, mm -hmm. and include you. Mm -hmm. I mean, now there's so many more people doing work here. There's a lot of people. And now our job is to work in partnership with people so we're not duplicating efforts. Mm -hmm. And people are doing a little bit different uh, things in the spectrum. And it's, it's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And people are improving villages. And now we should be we should just be all working together a lot right. more. But at the same time, including everybody who thinks that they can't do anything. You know, right. that's really, really important. Well, this is a testament to you can. Uh, well, I, yeah, it, yeah, I, you know, I know you can. Because, yeah. <laughs> because you've done it. But I also know that any, everybody can. And it really, it, from wherever you are, um, if you just seek a little bit, if you take one step, mm -hmm. you can get there. I mean, like cleaning up the, the, the yard in front of you or the yard in back of you or something mm -hmm. is a step. Final question, two part. Mm -hmm. 20 years uh, into this, 4.5 million trees. Did you imagine when you started this that you were going to end up doing what you've done, what you've been able to accomplish? And what's, what, what does the next 20 year period hold? I never imagine whether I can or can't. I just like just to did. put one step and one foot in front of the other. But I do imagine a vision for Armenia. And that is, um, I really would love for the nation to have as its vision and as, as its practice a sustainable forestry practice, which includes cities as mm -hmm. well as, as forests. And I think that we can, we can practice that and we can share that with the country and have people embrace it and understand why it's so important that we have soil, good soil, which trees are a big contributor, and good air, mm -hmm. and that the water is kept clean and that we all try to monitor the um, pollution that's happening today. We've got to not only monitor but change it. Mm -hmm. And that we understand that this is about all of us and that it's about people being able to live here into the future. You talk about people using a park. If people are, have had their environment polluted, uh, they're not even going to live long enough to be <laughs> able to use this. So it's really important that we all recognize where we are in this plan and everybody has a role. Everybody has a role. Carolyn Mugar, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for the 4.5 million trees, for your vision, your commitment, your love, and for the next 20 years ahead. Thank you. You're very welcome. Next time I'll interview you. Okay, it's a deal. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome.